Hey everyone, I am Life Her Vet of Life Her Podcast. I would like to welcome you, Saida. We are going to be talking about some amazing things legacy, estate planning, retirement crisis, um, just different things of that nature to get you prepared for your living trust. And I mean, just at all, because these things are so important and we aren't educated enough for it. And we also have to learn how to do it the legal way and not illegal. So excited going to get y'all all all the way together. (laughs) Excited. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me today. I love that. We're going to do it the legal way. Yes. (laughs) Girl, you you know how I be. (laughs) Oh, trust me. I I know. And And why we, and by we, I mean the culture, why we do certain things, I'll be like... Yeah, I know. But we and, it, and it mix it mixes up people. And I'm I've watched many of your videos and stuff, and I really appreciate you for not being one of those individuals and like really helping people because they really need to know. Like seriously. Yeah, yeah. And we're we're gonna get into some good stuff tonight. And you know, I don't know why we do it, but everybody know like that you got that one relative that passed away, but yeah. Yep. They name still on the house. They name still on the bills. I don't know why. Why black? Why don't black people tell when people die in our family? Why is it a secret? A lot of things is a secret, though. Yes. So we're going to get into it tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. But first, before we really get into that, I want to start by us actually getting to know you. So I see that you grew up in poverty and you just found your own way to get out of that. Because, you know, a lot of times people have um, a difficult time breaking generational things for them to basically want another route of life. So how did you start off having yourself, educating yourself and getting out of that situation and have better for yourself? Yeah. So for me, education was really the way out. I never thought that I was going to be an entrepreneur and never wanted to be a business owner. I was always go to school, get a good job, work really hard. That's going to be the way out. And so to escape a lot that was happening in my environment, I put my everything into school. So my entire life, I'm like, I'm that student for sure. Straight A student, raising my hand in front of the class, teacher's pet, you name it. But for me, (laughs) that was, okay, I need to do this. They said, do this. This is your ticket out. That's what I'm going to do. So for me, I was all about education. That is good. So when did you find a love for you actually educating people um, to basically want better for themselves, learning about financial goals and actually knowing what to do with their estate, even living and when they pass away? Yeah. So it's a a couple of key moments for me. The first moment was when I got my big girl job, my quote unquote big girl job. And I never forget sitting in that room and HR comes in and they say, you know, here's your 401k and here's your health benefits. And so when we got to the 401k part, I'm like, okay, mama, I made it. This is what they say. Go to school, get a good job, get good benefits. 401k. (laughs) Good benefits. But then right in that same meeting, they ask you, you know, you have to select what funds you want your money to be invested in. And I'm yeah. like, well, ain't nobody talk about that part. Nobody shared that step. And so I didn't know. So I remember looking over at Jay and Jay, he was an actual rocket scientist. Like that is what he studied. That was his profession. And I'm like, well, I'm going to put what Jay put because 401ks can't be rocket science. You know, like I'm gonna right. put, I put down what Jay put. Jay was wrong. Apparently 401ks are harder than rocket science. But it was at that moment that I'm like, I need to learn because I'm just getting started. I'm only at that time, 21 years old. You know, there's only going to be more of this for me. So I need to start learning. So that was my first real wake up call of what got me here won't get me there. And so I need to be accountable and start learning more about this next level or I'm going to be in a lot of uncomfortable situations. Yes. So what did you find wrong within marking something that you felt like it wasn't right fit for you? Within the 401k? 
Yes. So when you get your 401k, when you're putting money into it, a lot of people assume that that money is automatically being invested and it's not. So you can be contributing money into your 401k and that money actually not be invested. The second thing that happens is when you put your money in, it goes into the default account. And so most people just select the default account, which is also known as a target date fund. So based on the age of um, expected retirement for most people now is age 67, they kind of default you into some stocks and bonds that um, they get rebalanced. And by rebalance, meaning they go from risky to less risky as you get closer to retirement age. But when you look at the overall offerings of options that are available to you in your 401k, those are normally the most, the worst performing ones. So mm. it was having money sitting there that wasn't actually invested. I'm just contributing, thinking that it's investing and it's not. And then two, putting my money into the default account. And probably the third thing was trying to keep as much money as possible. Yes. Meaning they're like, oh, you can contribute up to you know, we match 6% or we match up to 5%. And I'm like, mm, I'm going to get, what's the least I can do? Mm -hmm. I come from a situation where I didn't have money before. And so right. I'm taking a whole lot of money out of my check. So what's the least I can do? Oh, 3%. Let me do that. So those are some of the basic mistakes that I made. And a lot of the same basic mis mistakes I see a lot of my clients make when it comes to doing their retirement planning, 401ks, deferred comp plans. Right. So what is some, what do you recommend for um, employees to do? So what you want to do when you get your deferred comp or your employer compensation plan is you want to ask for what's called a prospectus. So your prospectus, that is the brochure that comes along with that retirement plan that tells you all of the funds that you have access to. So when you get that, you can see which funds or which stocks your company allows you to invest in. So you can take, get that, look at that, and you can say, okay, I want to put a little bit of my money here. I want to put a little bit of my money there. Don't just go for the default. The second thing I do is I would recommend that you contribute in your retirement accounts, at least at minimum up to the default of what your employer is matching you if they match you. So those are the two things I would recommend you do. Okay. Um, so as time progresses, as you get older, and I know me myself, um, I started doing a IUL and I found that very, a lot more use, useful than a 401k and actually doing like a Roth IRA. Um, and I, and I thought that was like something a lot more better. Could you, um, break down the different things as far as 401k, Roth IRA, and also IUL. Okay. So when you hear the term 401k, IRA, 403b, 457, IRA, IUL, those are really nothing more than just tax codes. And the IUL tax code that allows for what some people use as a LERP, a life insurance retirement plan, is called IRS tax code 7702A. So those just mean that your money has different rules associated with it and it gets taxed a different way. So a 401k means you work for a corporation. 403b means you work for a nonprofit. 457, you normally have some sort of union, police officer, firefighters um, that do that. IRA, individual retirement account, 7702a falls under the umbrella of life insurance. So if you open up a tax book, those are just the sections in that textbook that govern how that money works in those rules. So 401ks, 403bs, 457 IRAs, they have very similar rules. Um, the biggest rule and difference is that there's age rules associated with it. So you have yeah. the nine and a half rule, meaning that you cannot touch that money before age 59 and a half or they're going to penalize you for it. Then you have what's called the RMD rule. That's your required minimum distribution rule, meaning that if you wanted to build generational wealth, if you wanted to leave that money to your children, the government says you can't do that. You have to take that money out before a certain age. And probably at the time that we're recording this video, that age is 73, but they continue to change that age um, yeah. normally a year. So that, those are the age rules and restrictions. Now, when you look at... Um, 
IRS tax code 7702A, which the IUL falls under, there is no age restrictions for that. You can use that money when you want to, and you can leave it in there to build generational wealth if you decide to. So that's one of the, the first biggest difference between deferred comp plans and using like a plan like um, an IUL to do something like that. The second thing is understanding how the money grows. All of your employer compensation plans, you can make 100% but you can also lose a hundred percent. Yeah. And so if you want to have some money and hedge against loss when the market is down, then you could use an IUL where that index part of the IUL means that you have what's called a floor. So when the markets are down, you don't lose money, but when the markets go up, you can make money. However, you're never going to make the top of the market. So if the stock market is going to do an all time high of, you know, 40%, 60%, you may not make that inside of your IUL. However, if the market does an all time low, how it did in 2008, it was down negative 37%. You're also not going to lose that money. Mm -hmm. So it's a great way to hedge against market loss and market correction. And probably the final difference is taxes. So all yeah. the third uh, compensation plans, you're deferring the taxes. That's what the deferred part means. I don't want to pay taxes now on this money. I want to pay taxes <laughs> later. And so what do you think taxes are going to be later? We're trying to get universal health care. We're paying for war. Yeah. We got to fund social security. We have all these things that are happening that taxpayers pay for. So when you decide to defer that tax payment until the next 30 years or 40 years, you don't know what you're signing up for, what yeah. tax bill is going to be 30, 40 years from now. Compared to an IUL or in Roth, any Roth account, you're going to pay those taxes now, but you're not going to pay any taxes on the growth of that money when you go to take it out. So those yeah. are just the key differences between having an employer retirement plan versus doing something on your own, like an IUL or a Roth IRA. But what I will say is, I don't believe I'm not one of those people y'all going to hear that says you put everything, put all your eggs in one basket. Right. Absolutely not. Should all your money go into a life insurance policy? I don't believe that. Should all your money go into a deferred comp plan? Are those the worst things in the world? I don't believe that either. I think you need a comprehensive plan based on your goals, unique to you that you understand how all these pieces work to get you to your ultimate dream lifestyle. And that's different. Yeah. You know? Yes, it is. And you know, so crazy. I actually had that, that switch of a mindset too, because I was thinking so much into my IUL. So I started to get into the Roth IRA through Fidelity and I'm like, okay, this is something a little different. Instead of me having all my eggs in one basket, I wanted to like, spread my wings and do something a lot different so mm -hmm. it was it was something it's something new I'm really not too educated in the rough RA just yet because it's like literally two weeks fresh it's new new but I, I feel like a lot of people at this day and time on how the economy is changing you know the shift in the currency and everything i feel like a lot of people should just invest more and save more and move their money a lot different than what they used to and be smarter about your money and not like be so into the materialistic things and think more of longevity because who's to say something else will come up and you need an emergency and you probably had nothing. Yeah. You know, and the biggest crisis that we're facing in America right now is the retirement crisis. Like yeah. if you on any CNN, NBC, any news that's talking about the markets and the economy, you're going to hear people talk about the retirement crisis where um, the millennial generation is the, in even, I would say generation X Generation X is going to be that first generation where they really don't have those pensions backing them up as much. And so yeah. we see how a 401k works. Did they save enough money? Generation X, that's my parents' generation. They went through 2007. They went through 2001. They went through a lot of things. So we're really getting ready to see what retirement looks like because the day of getting a pension, having a deferred comp plan, having somebody else, social security really be there for you where maybe our grandparents or great grandparents, they were getting multiple checks. 
They yeah. had retirement. Yeah. It's not money. <laughs> she always got something rolling in. She worked for two years. She got a picture from, you know, 30 different jobs that she didn't yeah. have. Those days are long gone. Yeah. Those days are long gone. So that's the crisis that we're really facing now. So whether you are an employee, whether you are an entrepreneur, whether you are a business owner, really understanding how do I set myself up for the future? If you're not looking at that, you're making one of the biggest mistakes financially right now. Yes, you really are because, and the fact of just saving your money and moving your money the correct way in mm-hmm. is is such a thing because you know childcare even increased. Um, I have a daycare center and childcare for infants now is like four hundred a week, you know, and that and that's a lot of money for someone that has a regular nine to five, even making. 100k 200k a year is still expensive Mm -hmm. for you to pay that much in child care so that lets you know how much it changed because the rates for child care has changed four times in the year wow Wow. like it's just continuing to increase and they're bringing up the the household um income rates and everything for them to actually be in the home but Mm -hmm. it's still it's still expensive it is, you know, and I, I, I used to say this, you know, middle being middle class is probably the worst class that you can be. Yes, it and definitely is. I, I didn't want to believe that because I told you I was to go to school, get a good job, work really hard, house, picket fence, dog. That was the dream for me. Um, mm-hmm. it's from where I came from. But when I got there, I was so sad because the only words I kept hearing your vet was you don't qualify. You yeah. Don't qualify. As somebody growing up on government says, I qualify for everything and I'm black. What you mean? Like, mm-hmm. I don't know. You don't qualify. You don't qualify. And I think an eye opener for me was when, um, again, my first year working, I went to go claim my daughter on taxes. And I was so excited because I'm like, oh, you know, if you have a child, you get all this money back. Mm-hmm. You tax yep. They said, absolutely not, Ms. Garrett. You make enough money. You don't qualify for any um, earned income credit, child tax credits. You actually have to pay the United States for populating a country. Mm-hmm. I said, they're not telling people in the hood this. <laughs> <laughs> they're definitely not telling us this because, hold on, what do you mean? I don't get no money. <laughs> you know brought, down, like, brought down all your expectations, huh? <laughs> my, you know, not, not, not everybody, but where I come from, you know, you. Yeah. You got too many kids, you only claim three, you know, you got a child trying to claim. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Story because I was middle class. And so I remember being in the supermarket. I never forget it. I'm in there. And um, by the time I was probably my early 20s, I had already crossed over six figures, which was pretty well. And so I'm in there with my little high paying job and I'm in the bread aisle counting which bread should I get by the pennies or oh, this one Whoa. is you know, 398 versus 297. You know, I'm trying to do my little budget. And then, no lie, two ladies come by on a come by my aisle, cart full of food, shopping cart full, playing like kids on the back, just pushing the carts, you know, how you go on the back and push the cart. Yeah. And something's not right with this picture. Something is not right with this picture because I did everything right. I went right. to school, I got the good job. I'm working really hard, but yet I'm struggling. And that's when I realized middle class is the worst class you could be because it means you make too much money for any government support, but yet not enough money to live your goals and dreams, to truly do all the things that you desire. And so I'm like, I have to get out of here, but then I need to show other people, how do we break free? How do we get out of here? Because nobody told us this. Nobody prepared us. That makes sense? Yes. Yeah, girl. Yeah, it does. So, so tell me, you you established, you got your job, you got your retirement together, you yes. got your life insurance, you got all of this stuff. How should people, or I wouldn't even say how, when should people start planning for their will and like trust and things of that nature? Yeah. So if you have income, if you have minor children and if you own property, you need an estate plan. 
you need an estate plan and your estate plan is going to be your financial power of attorney, your health care power of attorney. It's going to be your will. It's going to be your trust at minimum, a revocable trust. About 95 percent of my clients need just a revocable trust. So once you have one of those three things, you need to start planning your estate, because what that means is I have something. So your mm -hmm. estate, that is everything that you own everything that you have interest in and all the money that you have. Mm -hmm. That's your estate. And so what we have to do and what I find sometimes is troubling is that we don't value what we have. That's true. And so the question you just asked me, when should we start planning for what we have? If we have to ask that question, that means we don't value what we have. That's and true. Because we don't value what we have. We have things like gentrification running rampant in our neighborhoods. Yes. Because we said, don't nobody want to live there. Nobody mm -hmm. wants their mom's house. Nobody wants to live in that part of the city. We didn't see the value in it. But along came Mr. Developer. He said, hmm, I can do something with this. They saw the value in it, cleaned it up, dusted it off, added a fresh coat of paint. And now you have million dollar homes in the hood. And yeah. Set, but we can't be upset because we didn't value it. So we have to start valuing what we have, where we are with what we have as soon as we get it. Income, minor children, property, you need to start planning for your estate. It's yours. It has value. Start preparing for it. Mm hmm. And you know, developers are all around, especially now. They're, mm -hmm. they're collecting up land, abandoned houses. They are collecting everything and it's so crazy because it makes you think like, okay, where are people going now? And then, you know, the increase of um, rent and it pushes them over into a whole nother neighborhood. So then you have, and then I thought the investors and developers, they're in a whole nother state and they're coming to your city, yeah. never even lived there before or nothing. And they're just building something because they see the vision and we don't. That's it. And so we have to start looking for those opportunities. Like we have to go from being participants, from being consumers to actually being in the game. To yeah. Owners to having that mindset shift that says, you know what, if I see a, a empty lot in my community, how can I purchase that? If I see a business or um, a storefront in my community, how can I turn that into a business right where you are? Because truth of the matter is the grass is greener where you water it at. Mm -hmm. I have traveled to different parts of different communities and suburbs and inner cities and, and so forth for what I wanted. That makes right. sense. Yes. And in addition to that, when there are things that come to our communities or come to your community where you don't want that to be there, we have to vocalize that. Mm -hmm. You know, when I where I grew up, there was a check cash in place, a Chinese store and maybe a, a deli that sold alcohol and other things on almost every corner. Yeah. When I bought my first property, there was a wealth management firm on every on every street. What? What's the difference? Right. You got Edward mm -hmm. Jones, and the local guy. Like what happens? So what that means is that one community is speaking up saying we don't want this here. Another community is just letting people come in. So we have to be vocal and start saying what we want in our communities, what we don't want in our communities, and then us take ownership to actually be the person who establishes more of what we want to see. Mm -hmm. you know, me preaching on here tonight. <laughs> it's the truth, though. You know, a lot, of, a lot of people, a lot of us, we really need to realize that and how important it is. Mm -hmm. I, I see a little bit a lot more improvement but yeah. then at the same time it's just the new generation coming up they missing it if the information is there the opportunities are there everything is there but it's like they missing it and it's like man we we continue need to educate our people and everything so they, they exactly know what to do because sometimes they are clueless on even the first step yeah and I would say our generation, we're the first generation where we have all the pieces to the puzzle. Yeah. So our grandparents probably didn't know enough. Right. And then our parents knew that they had a, they had enough insight to know that this route doesn't work. 
but mm -hmm. I don't know what else to do. We have the information. We know that it doesn't work. And we know that we have the solution. We have alternatives to go get to it. So this is really where it's an, an important part in our histories and our legacies that we have to grab hold of this because if we don't, we're going to miss it. That makes sense. We are yep. the largest wealth transfer that's happening right now that our country has ever seen. $84 trillion is transferring right now. I don't know about you, but I'm like, where am I? What's my what's Man. Eight, eight trillion? You can get a million. You can get a yep. million. <laughs> yep. He's like, wait a minute, what I gotta do? What? Read. <laughs> yes. People aren't even aware. No, they're not. They're not even aware. So back to your question, you said, you know, they're building all these homes and development and they're pushing people out. So some people are confused and they're just looking like nobody's ever going to buy that. How are you going yep. to? But yet there's somebody coming in with cash, with cash. They said many students from, there was a, a, a article that came out that said Ivy League students are forgoing their education so that they can buy, they can buy businesses from baby boomers. They understand that right now, baby boomers, those are people born between 1946 and 1964, they are still the largest shareholders of the economy. They hold yeah. the largest amount of wealth. They hold the largest ownership in corporations and businesses and in small businesses. So as they are retiring now, so over the next 15 years, every seven seconds, a baby boomer is going to retire. As they're retiring, there are people saying, why go start a business again when they already hold the lion's share? Let me just go buy it from them. Yeah. They have to get out. So this wealth transfer, this $84 trillion is transferring. You got to go find out how you get a piece of that, how you get yours. And then we have to have the conversation with our parents, because believe it or not, there is wealth in our families. There is wealth in our communities. Other individuals aren't coming in. African-Americans, we have the seventh largest economy. If we were to take all the money we spend, and put it together, we would have the seventh largest economy in the world. Larger than Mexico. You hear me? Where everybody mm -hmm. wants. Larger than Mexico. People yep. come to our communities, but they know we're consumers. And so they take, 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 take. So we have to understand and believe that we do have wealth. There is wealth in our communities, in our families. And so we need to help have the conversation with grandma and aunts and uncles and so forth and say, what's the plan for this house? What's the plan for this property? Is there a reverse mortgage? How do we keep that in the family? Because if we're being honest, we all have stories about people in our family that we heard of once owned a business, owned some yeah. land, something down south. But what happens is they worked hard and built all that, but none of it transferred. Yeah, it stayed the same. We it stayed the same. It went on to a whole nother family of people that just developing something else. That's it. So we need to figure out how do we transfer that wealth? How do we keep this house, right? Let's not sell it to, you know, the little guy who got the sign that says, can I buy your house, right? Let's not jump at and get big out at the first um, opportunity of money that comes our way. Let's hold on to something. Let's pass something down. So for me, that's where my passion really comes from for legacy planning and estate planning is because I've seen people work hard for 30, 40 years and then have nothing to show for it. I've had mm. stories in my family, people around me, you know, we lost this, we lost that. Well, how come it didn't come here? If my great grandfather spent his entire life building businesses and, and owning multiple properties, there's no way that I should be starting from scratch. There's no way we should be starting from scratch every single time. We know how to work hard, but what we've never been taught is how to build. And that's one yeah. of my is how do I teach us how to build? How do we build so that therefore the, the, those coming behind us, they can struggle with the next level of struggles. They shouldn't have to be figuring out how they buy their first car, how yeah. they buy their first property, how do they start a business? And we have to break that mindset that giving our children something is going to spoil them or is going to ruin them. Life is hard either way, but it's yeah, it is. hard we let our children start to struggle with the next level of hard. That makes sense? Like, yes. figure out the daycare you got. Like, let's figure out how they take it nationally. 
how do you make it a chain? How do you make it a franchise? Like struggle with that. That is yeah. also a struggle. Getting it out the mud, we over it's, it's It's hard. Yeah, it, it, it's really hard, and you know, what's so crazy is um, we could sometimes find ourselves having friends that is still trying to get it out the mud, or friends that don't even have the mindset that we have, and we still be around them for so many years, but we are trying to move forward, and we still stuck too, and we have to realize that we have to put ourselves in rooms where we need to be so we can get a lot more educated on exactly what we need to be doing to continue to grow in our lives. If your friend didn't want to come, okay oh well you got to respect it I want to go somewhere else I need to figure out other things and me personally myself I've been in rooms with millionaires and it changed me it changed my mindset they were talking about things I don't you know you could think you doing something but girl when they start talking about some other stuff I'm like wait how how huh not you got to do what? And you know, it's it's crazy because, you know, we have a lot of people, we in the generation now, everyone has their own business. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people will get a building and rent out the building and do all these things. But yet, they're not thinking about buying the building. And then in the process of buying a building, they're not thinking about getting an architect and make get approval of different blueprints. And right. they're not thinking about having that on the side they're not thinking about having a business plan alone for their business to actually grow and so the banks can see their vision so they can get approved for bigger loans or find investors that's willing to spend their money on you to be able to take your business or yourself to a next level. And that's a lot of things that we don't even know about because if you have that heart and that passion and you're a good person and somebody see you trying, yep. so many people will invest in you and you will be amazed because they have money that they don't even know what they want to do with it. They don't. And that's so good. And that's one of the things that with my entrepreneur and business owner clients I talk about is how do we go from having a business that sells to having a business that we can sell. Mm -hmm. Because when it comes to wealth creation and, and wealth building, there's three phases to it. And I talk about this in my wealth creation quiz. Um, it's the first phase is building wealth. And so we've gotten that point, right? How to make money and preserve it, you have to build it. And the second phase is that you have to sustain the wealth. And so if you hit a million in your 30s and your 40s or whatever the case may be, you're not about to just roll over and die. You know, you have to right. sustain that for the next 40 years, 50 years, 60 years. You know, how do you do that? That's where mergers and acquisitions come from. So when you look at people like Elon and Jeff Bezos and so forth, what they're focused on now is buying and selling. Like I was watching the news report today and it's like Jeff Bezos is still selling his shares in Amazon and so forth because right. they're sustaining wealth. That's where mergers and acquisitions come into. So how do you now take this business that you've built? You have the systems, you have the processes for it. How do you get that value and how do you sell that? Mm -hmm. We struggle a little bit because we're maybe the first business owner, the first entrepreneur that's really been successful. And so we say things like, you know, I never want to sell this business and I want my children to hold on to it. When in reality, our counterparts are building, scaling and selling. Yes. That's what they do. Build a business, scale the business, sell the business. That's where you really get into that deep generational wealth. So you I'm do. Talking us i am i don't want to i don't want i am proud of where we are and when we have come from and the efforts that we're making but i want us to know that there's a next level there it is, is and we have to now be the ones responsible for doing the more yes we do and you know so crazy of you saying how they sell their businesses and everything they're buying land everywhere like crazy. They're building their own farms. They having land to place solar systems at. And, you know, they're thinking next generation. Even though we in here now, 
with everything changing with us having AI and everything, we need to think electrical. We need to think solar so much more futuristic for us to invest ourselves into that and educate ourselves to see which lane are we going to fit in at. So we know exactly what to do because it's so much that's coming and we have to be there. We have to be caught up. Yeah. And, and that's why you said earlier, you said getting in rooms, exposing yourself to more, you know, if you are not growing, you're dying. So you have to figure out what's next, you know? And I know you probably think like this already. I already know you think like this, like the end, this year is over for me already. That's it's not, been I, done. It's done. Done. <laughs> done. And some people like, oh, half of the year, like midway through. Mm -hmm. the stretch. I'm like, this year is done. What do we do for next year? You constantly have to be thinking ahead. You have to be curious. Like we, you have to allow your curiosity to say, I wonder what they thinking about. You no. know, if Jeff is selling all his shares on Amazon. We excited about buying our Amazon shares, you know, going with the good. I want to, he think about what's next. I want to what, what he doing next though. I want to, whatever he doing next, I want some of that too. <laughs> no, I will. I will tell you. I will tell you what they have going on because listen, I'm 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 tuned I'm tuned in in the mornings doing my workouts. I'm like, what's what's next, right? So the new race that they have right now was around AI. Yeah, right. And right. So, um, Elon and Oracle just did a split. You know, that was his AI partner, but he just split up. They just broke up, and so he needs a new AI. So what's next? And that's how we have to be thinking. What's next? And we're not going to get the what's next from maybe the people right next to us or no. a family member. And you have to be comfortable going into rooms and going into spaces and communities where maybe the, it makes you feel uncomfortable because people don't share the same viewpoint or that they don't look like you, but you're there for one purpose. I'm trying to figure out we're all high level thinkers. What's next? How do we grow? And so I'm glad you said it. Cause that's so true. I'm like, what they work <laughs> No, what's Seriously, that? you know, I I have a real I got a big fetish of Star Engine. Okay, I love going on there. I love seeing the futuristic things that they have coming out and everything. I ain't gonna lie, I invested in probably like four or five of them, <laughs> but but it's like it's so futuristic for you to figure out. Okay, this is what they're doing, and like slowly but surely, they're taking away storefronts. <laughs> And they have these like mini cars that will come and drop your groceries off in front of you. You could grab them out the truck. You could grab your drink. You could get food. You could get clothes. You could get your le like everything is coming right at your front door. Yeah. And it's like, man, this this is what we about to get ourselves into. Mm -hmm. And then you know, a lot of things is going to be monitoring off the sun. So they got so much solar things coming out. The homes are even changing. Some people don't even want those big old houses no more. They want solar homes and homes that look like mobiles. They got a home that unfolds, yeah. you know. So <laughs> you see that one that you could buy it off of Amazon. It was like a whole house you could buy on Amazon. Yes. <sighs> yes. So it, I mean, it's a lot, and it's a lot for us to figure out of which way we want to go as far as investing and my biggest thing is energy energy yeah. electric and stuff like that because they that's where they're going and so when you're looking at your financial portfolio this is why it's important not to have all your eggs in one basket yeah not every tool can do everything Right. And so if, let's say you say, you know what, I want to go all in with my life insurance policy. Well, inside your life insurance policy, you can't go invest in a solar company specific. Right. <laughs> right. You need a brokerage account to do that, but you can do that in a Roth IRA. And so there's two things when it comes to investing, um, three things, actually, when it comes to investing that you want to understand. The first thing is you want to understand how your money grows. Is the money that you're investing, is it growing fixed? Is it growing variable or is it growing index? Fixed meaning you're never going to lose money, but you're not going to make a lot of money. Those are going to be your safe investments. Variable, you can make 100%, but you can lose 100%. Mm -hmm. You can make some money, 
when the markets go down, you won't lose anything. When they go back up, you make some money. So you got to understand how is my money growing? Ask yourself that question when you're investing. How is my money growing? Two, you want to ask yourself, what are the tax implications on where my money is growing? Yeah. I'm growing that money in tax now accounts where every time I make money, I have to pay taxes. Am I growing that in tax deferred accounts where I don't pay taxes now, but later I'll pay those taxes or the tax advantage accounts? I get, you know, probably the biggest disappointment that I see right now in talking with clients around retirement planning is I have millions of dollars in my 401k and I don't need that money. But yet if I take it out, they're going to tax me so hard. Can I do something? I want to leave it to my kids. I don't want to pay all these taxes. And I'm just like, no. No, you can't take nothing. You can't move it unless you pay the tax on it. And that's heartbreaking to them because it's like, I didn't know that, but that's where you built it at. So it's not yeah. just good saying, you know, where do I grow? You know, how do I grow the money? But where I grow the money, where I invest the money is important um, for when, how you go to take that money out long or long later on in life and then the second thing is the rate of return the last thing is the rate of return that you're getting on your money really understanding that amateurs make money on the front end experts make money on the back end, back end. I need to know the interest i need to know the rate of return i want to understand how my money is making money and does that align up so when you're looking at where i'm investing what i want to do all of that goes into account it's not just like open up account, put a little bit of money in here. No. Mm -hmm. Plan. You need somebody who understands where you're trying to go to help you understand the moving parts to it. And again, you may be a person that's really into solar, very futuristic. You may be another person who's not. Right. It's okay. I'm, I'm a firm believer in all work works. <laughs> yeah, for real. You work it. All work works. But don't get caught up trying to do what everybody else is doing that you no. miss what's good for you or what's best for you you know that is true and you can easily get caught up because a lot of people run based off trends and a lot of times outside of those trends it's a lot of opportunities so much opportunity and even when it comes to like investing in stocks people are always trying to pick the big name stocks yes and here's the truth of the matter all right i'm gonna share with y'all this is the real deal when it comes how you how you build wealth Okay, this is how you build wealth in the stock market. The name of the game is shares. How many shares do you own? That is the secret. So let's say you have $5,000 that you want to invest. And you say, you know what? I really like what NVIDIA is doing, right? And NVIDIA is almost at um, $1,000. I like Amazon or whatever the case may be. And so you go take your $5,000 and you buy a stock that only gets you two shares or three shares or, or five shares, even if those shares grew by 100%, 200%, 300%, it's not going to move that much because you only have two, got two or three. Yep. You know, I always say a thousand percent of zero is still zero. So you don't That's have that many to move versus if you took that same $5,000 and you bought a stock that's consistent, that's going to grow, but you can get 100 shares. Now, if those 100 shares only move by 30%, you'll get a lot more movement. And that's called dollar cost averaging. So don't always go for what's big, what's loud right now, if your money can't buy you a lot of shares. The name of the game in anything when it comes to stocks and investing is shares. Focus on the number of shares that you own compared to the name brand of the stock that you own. That's my little mm. tip. Okay. That's a that's a great tip. <laughs> that's, that's a good one because people don't do that. Right? No, they don't because they just go off the name. Like you like you said, like the amount of money you spend it for for shares. Like, why do that? Yes, when you can get a hundred shares, you can get three hundred shares. And when you have a lot and they move a little, you're going to make way more than if you only have a few. They got to move a whole lot to, mm -hmm. to the goal of where you want to go. So y'all better okay. talk about <laughs> <laughs> so, so one of the things I noticed um, about you, you you big on women yes. and, and especially women in wealth. So we have a huge wave of women that's just getting it now. 
they they not playing no games at all what is your intake on just seeing how women is just growing so much investing so much and really we're we're changing the game we are and we are projected women are right uh, women are projected by 2030 to be 51 percent owners of the wealth overall and so you know this wealth transfer i talked to y'all about and i said 84 trillion dollars of that is moving that is where the shift is going to happen, where women will control 51% of the wealth in this country. That has never happened before. Okay. Never. So this is time for us as women to really step up, to really understand. And so even though we're making more money, even though we're entrepreneurs and we're doing all these things, when it comes to financial planning, when it comes to understanding how money works, we still shy back from that. We still yeah. don't do as much. Men still um, outshine us, it, you know, and not that it's a competition, just kind of the facts of what it says, right? But they still perform better in investing. They still perform better when it comes to retirement. And so we have to make sure that as the tables are turning in our favor, we have to step up and get in the game, not shy away from it. You know, so what's a few things happening. One, you have this wealth transfer that's happening. You have this shift by 20, 20 by 2030 that 51 percent of this country will be owned. The equity in this, in this country will be owned by women. But you also have this factor where now when a woman's husband, those who are married, when their husband dies, they want to switch financial advisors. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be with the financial advisor that my husband pick for us because mm -hmm. he didn't talk to me anyway. You was always X yep. about what we should do. And so the studies also show that women, when they're either left in inheritance from their parents or if their spouse passed away, they switch financial advisors. They want somebody who looks like them, who understand what it feels like to be in their shoes. And so on the other side of this, I'm also an advocate for more women getting into the financial industry because they're, they are yeah. looking for you. They they want yeah. to understand what it feels like where they are. So, yes, ladies, <laughs> ladies it, is, it is your time. And so, again, we have to be prepared. There's no point of having money and we don't know what to do with it. We don't understand it at the next level. So we have to continue to educate ourselves, continue to empower ourselves and continue to feel um, as though we belong and know that we belong in the seat. You know, yeah. that's other things. Sometimes we get there and, you know, I have so many clients, women clients who are millionaires and they are afraid to say it. Yeah, they are. They are afraid to say it. They don't add the accounts up. They don't want to look at it. They sit down. They say they, they're like this. <laughs> they, have, they, you know, they purposely move the money into a, a bunch of different accounts so that they never truly see all of what they have. In that moment, when I can say your net worth is two million, one point five million, three million, five million, they're like, really? Like they just light up. And this goal that you've been working for and building for, like you, you hit that. Like you did that. It's there, but you gotta now own it. Now you don't gotta go out flaunt it. That's not what I'm saying. No, you have to own it that we are hitting our goals. We are moving the mark. We are accomplishing what we set out to do. Our children, our families will be better because of what we're doing. And you deserve a round of applause for that because you did it. Yes. I'd be excited. <laughs> I did. Yeah. Like, seriously. So if um anybody wants to utilize your services, what do you have to offer them? What do they have to do to contact you and start them off with generational wealth and just retirement, trust, just all the different things that you offer them? Yeah, so I would definitely recommend that you go out and you take our wealth creation quiz. So you can go to wealthcreationquiz.com. Take that quiz and what it really is designed to do is going to help you understand where you are in your wealth journey, 
what areas you need to work on, and then what phases you should start with. And then after that, you'll be able to book a call with our team to see how we can assist you with that. So that's one thing I encourage everybody to do, you know, because sometimes people are just, they're a little bit nervous, right? But see if you're on track, see if you're off track, you know, or see if you have some work to do. I always say everybody's okay, but a 15 minute call can be the difference between an okay retirement and a great retirement. That's a true. Okay life and a great life. So go out to wealthcreationquiz.com, take the quiz. You can also follow us on Instagram at underscore Saida Garrett or at Transformation Wealth Group. Um, and then also visit our website, www.transformationwealthgroup.com to book a call. So what is your goal for yourself? <sighs> In which area? That's what that's what we, which area because I got a, I got a few of them. I want I want to start with um, Transformation Wealth Group. Yeah. So for Transformation Wealth Group, our whole mission is to enhance people's lives and to empower their dreams. And so it's building a platform that will allow people to talk about money with excitement again. Like a lot of times when we talk about money right now, it's just very dreary. Everything's high, it's expensive. Like nobody's excited about money. Nobody's excited about their life, nobody's excited about their future. Like we need to get back to dreaming again and making that possible. So growing that, um, continuing to expand that, continuing to grow our clientele nationwide, that's really the focus there. But having it in an environment that is transformative, that is not your dad's financial advice, right? It's not your your typical stuffy stuff. It feels luxury. It feels good. It feels like you. Okay, that's that. Yeah. So that's the wealth group. Uh, what we're focusing on there, and then also continuing to expand out our advisors. So we're constantly adding new advisors um, that understand the mission of where we're going and how we're helping families across the country. Whoa, that is amazing. You know, just even just the fact of you want people to talk about it again. And that's true because people, now that you said that, it's like light bulb. Like people really don't be excited talking about it. And I, and I think a lot that comes with that is a lot of people was like they struggled by coming up to get so much money you dealing with family you dealing with friends mm -hmm. you're dealing with staff you're dealing with so many things and it comes from people not having those mentors to actually guide them and still have the confidence and still keep them going energetically for them to know like these things happen these this is normal this is the this yeah. is normal for you to feel this way as you level up. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's really where the empowering dreams comes back to because we focus so much on the money because it comes out of this place of I got to get money. I have to get money. I have to get money. I have to get money that we don't realize that money is just a tool. Yeah. Like money really means nothing. It doesn't what your dreams are. And when you get excited about that is I've always dreamed about traveling, being able to provide for my family, giving my kids a good education, being able to wake up and not have to worry about an alarm clock, being able to give back and make an impact in the communities that I serve, being able to be fully devoted to my faith. Like those are the dreams. And so we want you to focus on that part because if you're just focusing on the money, the money, the money, guess what? Money is going to grow. Money is going to go down. It's going to dwindle and it's going to grow, but it's just a tool. And when we, at the end of the day, and I do this in my mentorship program, we talk about what your life plan is. At the end of the day, when the book, the good book is closed, nobody is going to get up there and say, oh, Saida made X amount of dollars. They're going to talk about how you made them feel. They're going to talk about were you a good person. They're going to talk about, you know, you ever been to... In my 20, my early 20s, I was obsessed with going to funerals, right? Because I wanted to hear how how they talked about people. Yeah. You know, well, everybody say the same thing. She was a person that if you went to her, she could count on you. And everybody get up there and say that. That is what's going to matter. Who are those three to five people 
that will stand up on that day for you? And what will they say? And I promise you, it's never going to be about money. It's no. never going to be about money. It's so character. You can't fall in love with the money. You have to understand that it's a tool. You have to understand how to use it, how to grow it but it's to get you to your dreams. And so we got to fall back in love with our dreams. We got to get excited about dreaming again because that's where the excitement is. Yes, you know, inflation is high. Yes, all these things are happening, but you know what? I'm blessed that I actually get to spend time with my kids. I get to allow them to, like, you know, like those are the things yeah. that talking about that makes us light up, that gives us that, that excitement. Like, you know, so that's where we want people to be at. So what is your one of your personal goals for yourself? Yes, girl, I'm fighting for my life right now. <laughs> hey, y'all follow me on Instagram. Y'all see me. I'm out here working out. I'm fighting for my life. I am focusing on health. That is that is my personal goal right now is health because me too. I have never heard a person on their dying bed say, I wish I had more money. They want more <laughs> time. They want more time and health is wealth. It doesn't matter if you have all this money in the world, if you can't spend it, if you can't enjoy it, if you don't really get to live longer. So I'm claiming 120 years. That's what God said I could have. That's what I'm claiming. And so I'm working on that. So that is that is my battle. That is my fight. That is my consistency right now is all about health. Yes. And you know, it, it matters a lot, especially when you trying to get to where you got to go. Yeah. It, it matters a whole lot because if you think about it, a lot of wealthy people they wake up about five, some even four for thirty, and they working out, they reading a book, they drinking coffee, they eating breakfast. You be like, dang, yeah. <laughs> and I'm doing that about like seven. <laughs> you know, so it's like you you gotta you gotta get yourself together. You have to. We have to take care of ourselves. Um, and even when it comes down to you know your finances. Healthcare yeah. is going to be your most expensive cost. It's health, yes. it's long term care, you know. So, you need to be healthy enough where you don't have to give your wealth away for people to take care of you, right? That's not what that's you're true. building for. So, we really got to take care of our body. So, that's my personal goal I'm working on. That is so true. So, um, in closing again, could you um, let everyone know your website, your social media handles, and everything on how to contact you? Yep. So you can go out to the wealthcreationquiz.com. Take the quiz. Okay. I want you to see where you are. I want you to know what areas you have to work on and you can book a call with our team there. You can visit our website, www.transformationwealthgroup.com. Or you can follow us on social media, on Instagram. You can connect with me at underscore Saida Garrett and you can connect with us there or at Transformation Wealth Group on um, Instagram, but we're also on Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, and YouTube as well too. So that's how you can connect with us. Yes, ma'am. Well, thank you so much, Saida. I enjoy talking to you. And you you taught me a lot, girl. <laughs> It was good. I'm, gl I'm glad that we got to have this conversation. Welcome back. Yes. yes. Welcome back. <laughs> so like, we here. Welcome back. Yes. I'm excited. Your platform is certainly needed. Your work that you're doing is needed. And so I'm glad that you are back and that you are continuing the good fight. Yes, I am. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to Life Hurt Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on our YouTube channel. And we have so many excited interviews to come up. And Saeed is actually the first interview of season four. <laughs> so a pleasure to start off with wealth. And we got so much more to come. Thank you and good night, y'all. Good night.